Um, I want to welcome everybody in all of the theaters here at Regal and online and everything to New Hope Windward. Pastor Dave is uh, obviously an old man now, but he's also serving at Kailua. So he's over there today having a good time. Uh, Kailua's got him over there. And we're going to be closing out our detox series today with a message that uh, I'm really, really excited about. Actually, when we first started this series, I've been really wanting to give this message. So it's really, uh, I've been really looking forward to it. This past week, if you've been with this church, we completed a three-day fast, right? And so if you join us in that, uh, thank you so much. It was from Sunday night to Wednesday night, and it was the worst three days of my entire life. It was uh, challenging, but it was also good. It was also blessed. Just kidding. I hope it went well for you. How many of us enjoyed the fast? Anybody? You guys lie. Come on, man. <laughs> like, like the other services, I'm like, who enjoyed the fast? And there's like crickets in here. But okay. Hey, maybe you did. If, uh, if you did, I guess we can do it again. You want to do it again? Another? <laughs> See, now you guys are like, no. No, no, no. It's not like that. Okay. How many of you have ever done some type of cleanse or a detox? Let me see your hands, okay? Yeah, okay, a good bunch of us have. And so there are all obviously all different kinds uh, that you can do. You can find a whole bunch online. I have done something for the past four or five years called the master cleanse on and off. And it, basically what it is is you take fresh lemons, squeeze it into water, and then you have uh, organic maple syrup and cayenne pepper. If you've never had it before, uh, it sounds kind of gross, but I, don't, I, I kind of like the way that it tastes. Like I would drink that lemonade every day, I think. And so what it is, is it's not really a weight loss type of a cleanse, although people talk about it like that. It really is a, a detox, right? It's meant to kind of flush out your insides. It's kind of like Drano for your insides and your intestines, right? It just kind of cleans you out on the inside. And detoxing, and the reason we call this whole series that is important because we just get contaminated in the polluted world that we live in. And we get polluted emotionally, we talked about that in week one, and spiritually as well, which is what we're gonna talk about today. So this detox idea is not just a physical thing. And so we're gonna talk about how to detox spiritually today. Now when I say that, my guess is that that might be something that you haven't maybe thought of before or not in depth, right? Like what does that mean to detox your spirit and how does your spirit get uh, toxified or polluted in the first place. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to jump to Colossians chapter three. That's in the New Testament. We're gonna start off in verse five. The apostle Paul says, put to death the sinful earthly things that are lurking within you or the, that are being toxic in you. Have nothing to do with things like sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. These are all like toxins. Don't be greedy for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming, meaning it's a big deal to God. It's important to him. You used to do these things if you're a Christian uh, when your life was still part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior. Again, toxins, right? Sign or dirty language. Don't lie to each other. You've stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Today, we're really going to focus on not just how to detox from those things, but how to do this in verse 10, how to put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Here at New Hope Winward, that really is the main goal of our church, is that we would help you know your creator and then to become more like him as you grow in your relationship with him. And so that's really, uh, this is the passage that I'm going to sort of camp in. Uh, if you have your Bibles again, you can mark it up, you can highlight it, things like that. I'm going to basically stay here. But before we jump into that, I feel like I need to back up just a tiny bit, and I want to say that what we're talking about today, okay, detoxing your spirit is so important. It's really important. I think in order for you and I to have a healthy life, this is a necessity. And it's super important to God as well, because this is way more than just talking about detoxing from stuff like sexual immorality or greed or anger or lying, you know, all, malicious behavior, all these different things. It's more than just behavior modification. It's more than just therapy. Because out of all the things to keep pollution free in your life, I think your spirit is the most important and also the most tricky because we don't always think about it. You need to keep a watchful eye on how clean and how toxic your spirit is. Because if you have a scale at home, you step on that thing and you're watching your weight, you keep an eye on that. We don't have a scale for what our spirit is looking like, how polluted it is and all that. But the, the concept is the same, that we need to be very aware of what's happening in our 
spirit. And here's the, the bottom line with your spirit. It's, it's really difficult to explain what your spirit is, right? In the Bible, uh, different cultures have their own opinions. But basically, what I want you to know is that your spirit is not yours, okay? It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to someone else. And that someone else is none other than God himself. If you go back to the beginning of creation, we're gonna look at Genesis 2 really fast, where God created the first human being, the first man, Adam. It says, then the Lord God formed the man, that's Adam, of dust, from the ground and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And so what's really interesting about this is that it says God breathed his own breath, right? Something from within God himself, he gave that to Adam. He breathed it into him. And what that tells us is that what makes you a living human being is more than just working biology. It's more than just a pulse and a heartbeat and brain activity, but something from God himself. And that is his breath. It's his spirit. The word that is used for breath here and throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, the word breath is the same word translated as spirit as well. So anytime you read through the Bible and you're reading the word breath or you're reading the word spirit, it's the exact same word. There's no differentiation. Like how we differentiate breath And spirit, back then they just had one word. It was breath and spirit, the same thing. And so your spirit is literally a piece of God himself, something that he shares from him with every living person. It's it's his, it's God's. We're all living on a borrowed breath from God. You know who else understood this concept of spirit and breath being tied together was the ancient Hawaiians, right? The Polynesians. In fact, a lot of cultures around the world have a very similar belief that your breath is tied to your spirit. You might already know this, but the term breath of life in Hawaiian is the word ha, right? And so they believe that your spirit is in your breath and they were totally right because that's exactly what Genesis says God did with us. The most famous Hawaiian word, the one word that everybody thinks about in uh, Hawaii, when they think about Hawaii, is the word aloha, right? I, I thought someone was going to say pow. <laughs> pow. Pow church already, right? No. It's aloha, right? And here's the really cool thing about the word aloha, is that literally when you break it down, alo means to be in the presence of or to share. Ha is the breath of life. Okay, so aloha means more than hello, goodbye. Aloha literally means to share the breath of life with another. To share the breath of life with another person. And what I think is really cool about this, you think about that, that's exactly what God did with us, with Adam, is that he shared his breath, he alohad us into being. Very, very cool. And so when we talk about Uh, detoxing, and we talk about why your spirit is so important to keep clean. The Bible, again, just going all throughout the Bible talks about this, but in James chapter four, uh, it says, don't you know what the scripture says? That God wants the spirit in us to belong only to him. Other translations would say that he yearns jealously for the spirit within us because he caused that spirit to live in us. It's him and we're borrowing it, right? I like to kind of, the when I think about that, it's like um, my, okay, so my thing, one of my things is guitars, right? If you're coming to church a lot, like I just talk about it nonstop, I may have an issue with it, but that's another thing to debate. Um, and the thing is, if I were to let you borrow one of my guitars, right, um, and, and, and I gave that to you and I said, hey, you know, I trust this to you for a week, uh, and, and you sent it back to me the week after, and it was dirty, it, like parts were broken, things were missing, you know, and just, like, it was just like, in horrible, horrible condition, and you gave it back to me. That's what the Bible calls uncool, right? Like that's just, not, that's just not good, right? And so I think the same thing is true with God's spirit. It's that he gives this spirit to us. We're, we're borrowing it. It's his. He's giving it to us. And for us to take that spirit and get it all polluted, all dirty, and then come back to him. And I think when he looks at that, he says, man, that's not cool. <laughs> you know, I mean, for lack of a better term. Uh, but also I think this is really important. And I really want to camp on this today because there is a big difference between living your life with with the spirit of God in you, living with a great sense of guilt or living with a great sense of fear and living with a, a sense of enjoyment. 
Okay, and so the thing with this, if I were to give you that guitar, I would hope that the week that you spend it, if you know how to play guitar, it would be like an enjoyable week for you, right? Like you'd be like, man, this is great, I love it. That, and then you wouldn't be so concerned about all the, the minute details, like, oh, what if I scratch it here? What if I get this fingerprint? What if I smudge it? What if I drop it, all these things? I mean, sure, think about those things, but the reason I want you to borrow it is because I want you to enjoy, right? I want you to feel the joy that you get through playing an amazing guitar and you get to make music with that, right? And I think that's the same thing that God wants for us is that, yeah, that spirit that's in us, that's his, but he wants us to take that and live with joy. He wants us to really like be alive with that and not be hung up on, oh my gosh, you know, my spirit is dirty. I gotta get it clean, you know, all these things. That's important, but it's not the main focus. Does that make sense? I think there's a big difference in the mindset. And so we're really gonna get into it today. How do we do that? How do we not just detox our spirit, keep it clean, but how do we do that in a way where that's gonna be something we look forward to doing, where it becomes our joy, it becomes something that brings us peace, it becomes something that we actually want to do. And I feel like as we open God's word today, we kind of unpack this a little bit, I think you're gonna find that it's actually not that complicated. And it actually can be a very joyful thing if we take the right approach and we take the right mindset, all right? So we're gonna jump into it. First thing I wanna do is talk about the kind of common toxins that will sort of pollute our sins. And this is gonna come right out of that verse in Colossians 3 that we looked at earlier. I'm just gonna kind of fly through these things. So uh, first, one of them would be um, anger. Okay, it says right here, now is not the time in verse eight, now is the time to get rid of anger. How many of us, (laughs) by show of hands, I'm laughing because I don't know. How many of us would say that we are angry people? Yeah, hey, you know what? You guys are honest, okay, good. I think most of us would say, no, like I'm not an angry person, okay? Now, maybe you're not an angry person, but what does it mean to have anger in your life? Okay, look at how the verse kind of unpacks. This is what anger means. It means things like rage. Listen, I've seen some of you guys on the road (laughs) raging a little bit, okay? I know this rage he speaks of, (laughs) okay? And and I'm, I'm guilty of it too. Quick story, my grandma, obviously love my grandma. She is an... I say this with absolute certainty, the worst road rager I have ever seen in my entire life. It was amazing (laughs) to sit in the backseat of her car and just watch my sweet old grandma become the craziest and the angriest and the most hateful person alive on the road. I have so many stories. I can't explain to you the words that she used, but um, it was pretty, it was something else, okay? And so anyway, she's passed on some of that (laughs) to me. Not a lot, but just a little bit, okay? So I'm guilty of that too. Things like malicious behavior, that's anger. That's when you actually act out something uh, bad towards other people. Things like slander, that's anger. That's, you know, it's tied to anger. So I think slander, uh, biblically, the, the when you translate it from the Greek, literally just means to talk stink about someone else, right? You ever talk stink about anybody, coworkers, family, just people in general, right? Yeah, sure, like we've all done that. Dirty language, listen, I know we're all in church, right? And in church, everything is hallelujah, amen, glory to Jesus, all that stuff, but can, like, can we be honest for a little bit? Uh, outside of the church building that you're in right now, which is the theater, and, and after 12 p.m. <laughs> on a Sunday, it's okay if you admit, right, that there's some dirty language that slips out of your mouth every once in a while, right? Maybe a little one here and there, a little bomb over there, whatever. Some of us, maybe it's more like a full-on waterfall, like, right, like nonstop, constantly. Listen, the bottom line is, like, we're all guilty of that, right? A little bit. <laughs> I see some of, some of this action happening over here. But listen, like, we're all guilty of that to some degree, right? It's uh, like nobody is perfect in this area, Another thing that it talks about that is a pollutant or a toxin for us is sexual immorality. It says have nothing to do with that. And then it's gonna unpack that a little bit for what that means. This right here I know is a very sensitive thing. Uh, it's, it makes people really uncomfortable. It makes me kind of uncomfortable to even have to talk about it. But the thing is God talks about it in his word and so we need to make sure we talk about it in his church as well. And the, the, why this is such a sensitive topic or one of the reasons why it's so sensitive is in our culture, we're completely oversaturated in sexual content, uh, in, in sexual immorality. We just are. And so what happens is we've normalized 
what God calls sexual sin, we've normalized a lot of it. And so we're living in this tension in our culture. It's kind of difficult at times to make out like what is honoring to God and what is not. The Bible has a lot to say about it. Uh, and the problem, another problem is that a lot of us think, hey, you know, as long as what I'm doing when it comes to the realm of sexuality is not hurting anybody, it's not getting in anybody's business, it's, you know, it's not causing problems with anybody, then it's, it's okay and it's nobody's business but my own. And the problem with that approach and that thinking is that your spirit in you is still from God and God has a little bit of a higher standard oftentimes than we do, right? Where if we, wouldn't, if we couldn't see God involving himself, or just think about Jesus, involving himself in some kind of a sexual activity. Okay, maybe this is a bad illustration because Jesus had a different assignment than the rest of us, right? But if we couldn't see him approving of those things, then there's probably some kind of sign in that right there. But I'm just gonna break down sexual immorality into, some, into a very simple definition, uh, which is basically, it, it's a whole process that happens and is played out. It starts in your mind and then you play it out a little bit. You kind of test the waters. You bring a little bit of action to the surface and then it, you just kind of fully go for it and you engage in a physical sexual sin. And so it, the Bible kind of paints it like that as well. When it talks about sexual immorality, the first thing it's, it mentions is impurity, talking about impure thoughts. It's all in your mind. So it's thinking those things, those thoughts about someone else, and, and it's entertaining those things in your mind. Jesus himself said, if you look at another person, another woman, he's talking to guys, uh, with lust, then you've committed adultery in your heart. <laughs> That's just what Jesus said, right? It's like, whoa. And, and so it's, it starts here in the mind. That is sexual immorality, right? Not just the stuff that happens afterward. It's this right here as well. And then you carry it further. Lust is, is still in the mind. It's very much a mental thing where there's a lot of uh, fantasizing and things like that. But then you're kind of testing the waters a little bit, right? You're kind of trying to see like, is this okay? Can I get away with this? It's kind of that, that flirting with that person that you know you're not supposed to be doing or just kind of testing it. And you can do these things like on screen, off screen. There's just a lot of ways that that manifests itself. And then the last step is basically you just kind of give everything to that. And it becomes this full, uh, you've, you've kind of gone all the way and you've just made a full on sexual um, physical Sin And the Bible says that's evil. The desire that it comes from is an evil thing. What I want us to take away from this is that all of this is sexual immorality, right? It's not just this at the end when you finally do something physical. It's, it's everything. And the, and the reason that's important is that's like all of us struggle with that, right? I struggle with that. And if you say you don't struggle with that, I would call you politely a liar because the, that's the reality. All of us struggle with this to some degree. And, and I think if you're having a hard time saying, yeah, no, I do struggle with that. I think if you're having a hard time saying that, that would be your first step. Because until we're honest about the ways that our, our spirit is polluted, the, if we're honest about the ways that we struggle, we're not gonna actually be able to fix that, right? You can't detox something if you don't think it's there. And so that's another thing that uh, talks about as a toxin for our spirits. Another one is greed. Uh, this is a Continuing in the verse, don't be greedy. Now, again, a lot of us probably wouldn't say I'm a greedy person, right? But then it kind of defines that further. And it says a greedy person is an idolater. And then you say, I'm definitely not an idolater. I don't even know what that means, right? But I don't, we don't use that word anymore, but that's not me. But then it breaks it down further, which means it's worshiping the things of this world. Now that makes a lot of sense to me, okay? Because have you ever been in that mindset where you like need the latest and greatest thing like you've had your phone for a year and it has a tiny ding on the corner and you're like, need a new phone, right? This one's old and my friend has the new one or you're driving your car around and you're like, I need a new car. This one is two years old. It's, it's just worthless, right? And you just, we're always looking for the next best thing, the latest and the greatest, all of that thing. It's, that, it's something that comes from a worshiping of the things in the world. I think it's more than just possessions as well. It's more than just materialism where we can become greedy in things uh, obviously like wanting things that other people have, but when we start to compare ourselves with, an, with one another, I think it comes from this, this same heart, this same spirit where you look at someone else and you think, how come they have what I don't have? And it doesn't have to be possessions. It could be, why do they have the looks? Why do they have that spouse? Why do they have the, why did they get the breaks? Why do they have all the favor? It seems like in their lives, they have all this blessing. Like, what about me? And that comparison thing kind of flows from this as well. And so what I want us to do is to not 
again, like beat ourselves up on this because the reality is, and I will be the first to admit to you, that I struggle with all of those things. We all do to some degree, to some level. Now you may not struggle with one or the others as much as somebody else, but that doesn't mean you're not in that struggle as well. And I think that it's so important for us to do is to say, yes, you know, like I do have some pollution in my spirit. It doesn't really matter how long you've been coming to church, how long you've been a Christian, you know, how good you sing as a, a worship song or something like that. We all struggle with this. But what I, again, what I wanna do is we've just talked about the bad stuff, okay? So the uncomfortable part of the message is over, hallelujah, Jesus, right? Because now we're gonna transition into, well, how do we do this then? How do we, uh, because that's all bummer, right? Like this is, it's kind of a downer just to like sit and have somebody talk about this stuff or even me to talk about it. It's not like my favorite thing in the world, but how do we, how do we flip this instead, like I was saying, where we're detoxing in a way where we are actually enjoying the process. And we're not just sitting here thinking, oh, I'm so bad, I'm so terrible, I'm a sinner, I'm the worst person ever. There is a way to do that. It's tied into a simple phrase. And if you were uh, fasting with us this past week, I think it'll make some sense to you. And that is to starve sin and feed the spirit. If you're taking any kinds of notes, I think that would be the one thing to write down. But starve sin and feed the spirit. While we were fasting for the three days this past week, I said two words probably a hundred times a day. I'm starving, <laughs> or sometimes I'm dying, right? I don't know about you guys, uh, but I'm a horrible faster, okay? I just, I am, I whined a lot, you know? It was, uh, it was not a good week for me. <laughs> was, uh, uh, I'm so glad none of you saw me, and if you did, I don't know. I, forgive me, I guess. But anyway, it was, it was really hard, right? And for a lot of you, I'm sure it was difficult as well. But I, I, was, I, I whined so much. I was like, oh God, like I'm so hungry. You know, I'm, I'm just dying over here. And uh, why did Pastor Dave ask us to do this? And <laughs> no, Pastor Dave didn't ask us. God definitely asked us to do it. But you know, I'm, I was just like finding, I was trying to justify everything, right? Like God, if I fall down with my mouth open, on that chocolate on the counter, like that's not a sin, right? That's a trip, right? That's an accident. Or, so you, and, you know, I'm trying to come up with all these crazy things. But do you remember how uh, last week in the message, Pastor Dave was saying, it's not just fasting, it's fasting and praying, right? That we were ba literally starving our bodies, but feeding our spirits through prayer. And the same principle is at work here where you're not trying to just stop something. You're not trying to just avoid, like starve sin. Listen, if you only focus on starving sin, you're going to be a starving person, right? But we're not trying to be starving people. We're trying to be people that are full. We're trying to be people that are filled with something better than sin. And that is the spirit of God that is within us. And so remember how Pastor Dave talked about doing uh, replacement foods as well? How uh, When you talk about uh, detoxing physically and then putting healthier foods in your body, it doesn't have to be this thing where you just, you know, go all vegan if you're a full-on carnivore, right? Like, that's not the answer. The answer is to make small changes. I have a praise report uh, in my area of making small changes to my physical eating diet. And so uh, yesterday, uh, I gave my kids a snack, and then two minutes later, they said, Dad, I'm starving, you know, <laughs> like dad, I'm so hungry. And I was like, dude, you guys just ate, right? And so um, I did what every parent does when you're driving and your kids tell you're hungry, you just go to McDonald's, right? I don't, I don't know what you do, but that's, that's what happens most of the time, right? So I go to McDonald's and uh, I, I pull up and then the whole one, two, three dollar thing was blowing my mind. I was like, I couldn't believe you could get a triple, double quarter pounder or whatever for two bucks or something crazy like that. Uh, but I was, you know, avoiding all that. And I basically, I went in and I said, okay, I'll take three small fries for my starving children in the back. And typically what I do is I get a large fries for me because I'm an adult, you know, and I can, I, you know, that's, that's big boy stuff, right? Um, not because I don't love my children. It's just, they're going to like waste it and stuff. So I get them uh, small and I go large. But then I just felt like, you know, Maybe I need to take a little step <laughs> in, in this area here. So I did it, church. I got a small fries <laughs> for myself, okay? And, okay, thank you. You know, last, last service, nobody clapped for me because they were like, so what, Hanzo? Like, big deal, right? But that, my point is, just make a little change. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't have to be this big, old, grand, sweeping, like, life-changing type thing. Little things. And if you can do this spiritually as well, I'd say you're on the right Path. And so how do you feed your spirit? How do you make these steps where you starve that, but you feed it? Here's how you feed your spirit. 
This comes just in the very next verses in Colossians. One of the ways is through church, being not just coming to church, but fully investing yourself in a church family and feeding your spirit on everything it has to offer. Verse 14, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us together in perfect harmony, us being the church, being bound in harmony. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. I think that's hitting it right on the head. What, what I'm talking about is that we're not trying to let a sense of guilt rule in our hearts, right? Or a sense of the, that, oh, we're so bad, we're so bad. We should feel conviction over our sin because it is a big deal to God. But over and over you say that, no, don't let that rule your hearts. It's the peace from Christ ruling your heart. And then it says, for members of one body, that's the church, you're called to live in peace and be thankful. And so just committing to being a part of a church and just jumping in and going all in and saying, I'm going to feed my spirit on everything the church has. That'll include things like small groups. Um, that'll include things like serving in a ministry. You have flyers in your bulletin if you want to do that. Even things like uh, taking a part in the mission of the church through regular giving. That's all jumping into saying, I'm going to just be a part of the church. Another way that he talks about just continuing in the verse is to feed your spirit on God's word. Maybe that's an obvious one, but verse 16 says, let the message about Christ in all of its richness fill your lives. The message about Christ, that's, that's the word of God. The whole Bible talks about that. The Old Testament, this is a super generalized way of summing up the Old Testament, but it's basically saying there is a Messiah that's coming. It's promised. It's promised from God. And then the New Testament talks about how that was fulfilled in Jesus. It talks about what he did and what his followers did after that. And so that is the word. That's the message of the Bible. And it's rich. And then it says, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom that he gives. And so I really want to encourage you to uh, the series that we're starting after Football Sunday is called Breakthrough. And I wanna encourage you to make it a point to attend these ones because we're gonna really go deep into God's word. We're gonna look at people, men and women from the Bible. So it's a really uh, in-depth kind of Bible study type series where we're gonna look at their lives, men and women who experience uh, miraculous breakthrough from God and how we can have that too, if you're needing some of that in your life. And so we're gonna jump into that. If you join a small group, you get these materials. That book has daily devotions in there. If you've never done that before, it's really helpful. It's, it's feeding your spirit on God's word. You take a passage of, of scripture, and then we show you instructionally how to, how to do that, how to interact basically with God's word and feed your spirit. Okay, so that's another thing is God's word is extremely important. Another thing that Paul talks about is feeding your spirit with songs. It says, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. I put a pause right there between verse 17. I think that the songs that we sing here at church are basically like, um, like a spiritual buffet for your spirit, right? So just eat up, you know, just really go for it when it comes to the worship songs. And don't just limit your singing to Sundays either. I kind of feel like that's not quite enough. You know, there are the reality that we live in today with social media, the internet and everything is there are so many churches, not just in the nation, but around the world that are producing so much amazing music regularly. I mean, it's like every couple of weeks, it seems like there's a new worship album or a new Christian album or something like that. And all of that is stuff that's meant to feed your spirit, right? Um, there's nothing quite like music to kind of stir your, your spirit. And so I am a very good, typical Japanese man. Like I don't cry a lot, okay? Because that's the Japanese man in me. So I'm just being faithful to my roots. You know what I'm saying? It, it takes a special situation <laughs> for, for that to happen. And so um, it's just sometimes there's these songs, man, that really will just get to me uh, only when I'm driving in the car <laughs> by myself. And so a quick story, I was driving, I think it was from Wahiwa or something one night. How many of you, please raise your hands. How many of you have ever heard the song by Hillsong United off their new album, Wonder? It's called uh, So Will I, 100 billion times. Anybody? So Will I? Okay, good. You guys know what's up. All right. That song, if you haven't heard it, you gotta write it down, you gotta Google it, not right now. Don't bust your phones out right just yet. But you know, you gotta, you gotta look it up, okay? Because that one for me like, has been the one that like, just blows your mind and, and this just starts like, flowing, right? Like uncontrollably. And so I'm <laughs> driving home uh, from Wahiwa. I'm at a stoplight, okay? And, and it's just that, at that point where, you know when you try to hold back the cry and you make like that, 
like that, like that ugly like frog face, you know, and you just can't like, oh my gosh, this, you're, you're, it's making it worse. Your lip starts to shake because you're trying to hold it back, all that stuff. And so I'm in my minivan, right? Because that's what I drive now. I got kids. I drive a minivan. I used to ride motorcycle, right? And so right as I'm pulling up to the stoplight with the ugly like, bleh, bleh, you know, like trying to like hold all these tears in, this super amazing manly dude pulls up right next to me on this awesome motorcycle. And I'm like, oh no, you know, like, like no, like Jesus, why? And, uh, and I'm just having this moment where, and, and I just couldn't help it, you know, because the, the, what that song is about, okay? The thing is you can have an emotional reaction to music, to songs, but when a song is there to glorify Jesus, it's about him, the spirit that he's put within you is resonating with that. And it's, it's doing something extra to you that a regular song is not. And so I just want to encourage you, you know, to, to make that a part of your life. Like there's no reason we can't fill our playlists with these types of songs, right? That we can't fill our earbuds with more songs that are basically worship unto Jesus. It doesn't mean you only listen to that, but I mean, include that as a part of your music diet, if that makes sense. Okay. And so verse 17, everything kind of boils down to this then, like whatever you do, or you say, do that as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And so there it is again, right? It's like this life that we're living, it's one where we're just constantly giving thanks to God. Not where we're looking at ourselves saying, oh, bad me, you know, horrible me, I'm such a a wretched person. There's verses that you can pull in the Bible out of context to support that, you know, that sort of guilt living. But this is, that's really not the message, right, of, of the gospel. It's, it's something much different and much better. And so the more that we do this, I feel the more that you, you make it an effort to starve yourself of those things, the sins that we talked about, and replace that to feed your spirit then with the songs, with the word of God, with his church, the more it's gonna make you feel that joy, that peace of Christ that'll rule in your hearts. And it's gonna be a much more enjoyable experience than just starving yourself. Because God doesn't want his kids to be starving. He wants us to be filled, not with sin, but with his spirit. And so we really just felt like as a church, it was uh, appropriate and good for us to finish off this detox series by taking communion, okay? And so communion is typically called the last supper, right? But I want us to think of, of it today, not as the last supper, but as the first meal of 2018 for your spirit, okay? When we, um, before the ushers pass the trays down, I also wanna say this, communion, the, the Bible tells us, is a time that is basically for believers, for people who are followers of Jesus, all right? And I say that because if that's just not you at today, that's fine, you know, just pass the tray down and um, nobody's gonna judge you, right? If you just pass it down or anything like that. Um, it's, if you're gonna join us, you know, take a juice, take a bread and hang on to it. Don't take it right away. The first time I ever took communion, I didn't know what was going on. Like I'd never been to church before. And then here comes food down the row. I'm like, oh sweet, it's like snack time in church, right? <laughs> bread, juice, like, can I take two, right? <laughs> so I didn't know, don't do that. Uh, just grab it and hang on to it if you're gonna participate with us. One more thing, at the end of service, if you come to this church regularly, typically that's the time when during the prayer, I say, hey, if you're gonna begin a, a relationship with Jesus today, you wanna follow him, go ahead and raise your hand. I'm not gonna do that today because I feel like if you're going to make that decision today, and that's something that you know right now, even before I start praying, you're saying today, hey, I just, I, I know this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm gonna follow Jesus. I'm gonna stop living the life for me, a life of sin. I'm gonna live a life of the spirit. I wanna live with Jesus and for Jesus. And I wanna invite you to make that decision by taking this communion and having this communion meal be basically the first time that you commune with God, that you start this relationship with him. So Ashraj, you can go ahead, pass down the trays down the rows, grab a a juice, grab a bread if you're gonna join us for communion. And I want us to, as we hold the bread, as we hold the juice, obviously reflect on the body of Christ, right? That was tortured, that was crucified, that was nailed to a cross for us. You know, hang on to that juice and and think about how he shed his blood and how that was for a payment for you and I, that every sin that we've ever committed and will commit in the future, that he paid for that with his very own blood so that we didn't have to do that. 
And so all the things that you normally associate with communion do that, but there's gonna be a bit of an extra uh, touch that we do today as well. Uh, Jenny and Brandon are gonna come up and they're gonna sing a song of praise. They're gonna sing a song called Great Are You Lord. And as they sing, this is not really a time for you to join along in the song. This is really more of a time for you to sit and reflect on the lyrics of the song, on who Jesus is, what he's done for you. And what I want you to do is I typically have us all take it together, right? I typically say, let's take the bread, let's take the juice. Um, I'm, I don't, <laughs> I don't wanna do that. I'm not gonna do that today. I'm gonna leave it up to you for you to take your own time at some point during the song as they're singing, it could be in the verse, it could be in the chorus. Uh, it's, it's really gonna be a shortened version of the song, so it's just a couple of minutes. But at some point during that song, when you've spent just some time sitting with Jesus, reflecting, you take the bread, you take the juice on your own when you, just when you feel like it, okay? And, and I'm not gonna lead us in that time because I really want this to be a personal time for you. I want it to be an intimate time between you and God. And then when the song is done, I'm gonna come back up. And so would you bow your heads with me if you've got your bread, if you've got your juice, bow your heads with me. I'm gonna say a quick prayer. Father God, I, I just thank you so much. And as a church, we thank you for what you've did on the cross. And no matter how many years we follow you, Jesus, it is never, ever gonna get old to look up at that cross with that crown of thorns jammed into your head. It's always gonna bring us back to the place that we need to be. It's just never gonna get old. And so together as a church, as a church family, God, we, we sit before you now in your presence under your aloha and we remember you. We look back on all that you've done in our lives last year in 2017, the years before, and how your great love has carried us through another year. And we're gonna look ahead, God, to all the things that you have for us this year. I pray, Jesus, for any person who is gonna make that decision to follow you today. You know, what a special time this is gonna be. And so God, as we sit right now and reflect Help us to sit and reflect and not sit and fall asleep <laughs> in our recliner chair, but to really just spend some time with you, Jesus. We love you. We're grateful for you and all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. They're gonna sing, and when you feel led, go ahead and take the communion.
Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Not only did you share your breath, your spirit with us, but then you went even further than that and you shared your only son with us in flesh and in blood. You've literally shared everything that you could possibly share with us and we deserved none of it. Your grace is amazing. Your mercy is so far beyond our comprehension. And Jesus, we want to spend the rest of our lives becoming more like you and honoring you in all that we do. God, I, I thank you for every person who's made that decision to be your son, to be your daughter, to have that relationship with you today. I just rejoice with them in this amazing time, this amazing decision that they may have just made right now in this moment. I also pray, God, for each and every person here in this place because every single person here, myself totally included, we all struggle. We all have some pollution in our spirit. And our spirit wasn't like that when you first gave it to us. And every day of our lives, we're going to have some level of that in us. But you don't have anger because of that. You have mercy, you have grace, you have love. And I pray, God, that from this moment on, we would live our lives for you, with you, not with the weight of guilt, although we should feel a heaviness over sin, but that we would live with a lightness that comes from your peace and from your spirit. So Jesus, I pray right now in your name, by the power of your spirit, that you would break any weight of guilt that someone might be feeling or maybe have lived their entire Christian faith with, to know that that's not something you ever intended them to carry, but that you wanted the filling of your spirit to make them feel lighter than ever so they could really, truly live this life that you meant them to live. I look forward to all that you're gonna do in 2018. We're grateful again for your friendship, for your Lordship, for the spirit, your breath that you share with us. We're gonna live a detox life with you, Jesus, and for you. In your name we pray, church, amen, amen. Could you give it up to the Lord, the one who deserves our praise? Thank you, Lord.